Take your Bible and turn to the epistle of Jude. Jude. We'll begin our reading in verse number 24. Jude in verse number 24. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. And pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us as we come to this, your word tonight. And dear Lord, I pray that you would give us what we stand in need of. I pray that you would set me aside for a little bit, fill me full of your spirit. Give me unction and power from on high. And I pray, dear Lord, that each and every person here would take what is said tonight and apply it to their lives. And dear Lord, may we just go out of here trusting in you and trusting in your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. Now Jude is a, a little book packed full of deep thoughts. Uh, we've preached here recently out of verse 11. We preached several weeks on the way of Cain, the heir of Belim, and the gainsaying of Kor. I've preached on the really the thought of the book of Jude that we're to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And, and tonight, I, I want to look at this phrase found in verse 24, and to present you faultless and to present you faultless. Now, a lot of people will take and mess up this verse and really put you under pressure that is not needed. Because when the Bible says to present you faultless, a lot of people will just take that phrase and take it out of its context and say, listen, God wants you to live a sinless life. And He does. God would love to be able to present you faultless before Him, but He can't. And that's where it gets discouraging. But if we remember and stop and think about the, the context of this, it changes it. Now, granted, our position in Christ is we are faultless. Amen? Amen? Before God the Father, we have no sin. But the reality is, and practicality is, we're not there. But, like I said, you put this in its context. Well, what's the context? That we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. You see, I believe this verse in its context is contending for the faith. And God wants to be able to present us faultless as those who have done everything we can, humanly speaking, to contend for the faith. Listen, we have a Bible worth contending for. Amen? What are you doing to contend for it? When people pull out the wrong versions and stuff, you say, can I show you something about the Bible? I believe we should have the Bible. I should believe we should have the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God. Amen? Amen? Can I just show you something about that book you have there? And try to teach them. 
You see, when, when people bring out stuff and we ignore it and we say dumb things like, well, it doesn't really matter, that's not contending for the faith. When, when people talk about how, well, you get to heaven your way and I get to heaven mine, do you stop and say, well, no, the Bible says uh, in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And, and just tell them, hey, listen, it's not about your way and it's not about my way. It's about His way. Yeah. Earnestly contending for the faith. Standing up for truth. Man, in a world that's been deceived by Satan and confused by this world and by religion, not too many people are taking a stand for the things of God. But yet the Bible still tells us we are to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Today we're getting kind of weak in the backbone. Limp, if you will. We won't stand strong. We won't stand for the truth. But we need to stand on the Word of God. As far as our position goes, listen, we know we're secure. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103 and verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. We know as far as our position go, we're good. The Bible also says in Isaiah 38 and verse 17, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. It also says in Micah, Chapter 7 and verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Amen? Amen. Positionally, we're good. But practically, can God present you faultless in this area of earnestly contending for the faith? I'm afraid all of us fall short at times. We don't, we don't want to deal with confrontation. I understand. I don't like to deal with confrontation. But listen, I'll take a stand on the Bible. I'll take a stand for truth. Why? Because people's lives are in the balance. Their eternity is in the balance. Is the Bible that important? Yes. Yes. It is that important. Listen, when people out there are teaching there's errors in the Bible, I'm going to take a stand. Because if there's errors, then what are you basing your faith on? Maybe you're basing it upon error. Right? Well, no, I know what it is because I know which is error and which is not. Really? Really? Oh, there's people that believe that. They, they say, hey, this contains the Word of God and I'll tell you what's the Word of God and what's not. Like you're God. No, let God be God. And so we see within the context of this that in this thought of being faultless, God says, listen, we are to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And so, number one, we must remain faultless in our standing for the Word of God. Listen, this King James Bible is worth fighting for. It's worth taking a stand for. Well, you don't know what, how much trouble I'll get in with the outlaws. Oh, excuse me, in-laws. You don't know how much trouble I'll get in with my family. Listen. How about you be more worried about what kind of trouble you'd get in with God? 
You'll have to deal with that a whole lot longer than you will the outlaws. Or the friends. Listen. If they're truly friends, they're going to want to see if, hey, they missed something. Don't be afraid to take that stand. Hey, I'd rather stay with God. Listen, if you stand with a thousand people and not God, you're in the minority. But if you stand with God against a billion people, you're always in the majority. Amen? Take a stand on God's Word. Psalm 68 and verse 11 says, The Lord gave His Word, or gave the Word. You know, that's the faith once delivered. He gave the Word. Great was the company of those that published it. That is those who have kept and contended for it throughout the millenniums. You see that? Psalm 68 and verse 11. The Lord gave the word. That's where the once delivered comes in. And then the great company of those that published it are those who contended for it and kept it. Because it's been published again and again. Not changed, but re said again and again and again throughout the centuries and millenniums. God has always kept His Word alive. Listen, you think about this in the days of Josiah. The priest stood up and proclaimed the Word of God, published it. It had been missing for over 50 years. It wasn't missing. It was right where they were. They just couldn't find it. But it was republished again. Guess what? There was a lot of people there that was 40 years old or 45 years old or 35 years old who had never heard it. So they was hearing it for the first time. It was published. It was proclaimed. They stood for the truth. Acts 20 and verse 27 says... For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul is stating, listen, I have published this to you. I have contended for it. I have given you everything. All the counsel of God. Would the God churches get a hold of that again? Taking a stand and proclaiming all the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor, listen, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. He said we didn't handle it deceitfully. What's deceitfully? Changing the gospel. Saying there's no heaven or hell. Saying Jesus is the brother of Satan. Saying God is love and not going to let anyone go to hell. Hiding truth. Narrowing the Bible down to just a few books. That's handling the Bible deceitfully. Paul said, listen, he said it in Acts, I, I, I have not shunned to give you all the counsel of God. I preach to you everything. That's what we need today. to preach or teach contrary to its principles or doctrines. The greatest doctrine of all Bible doctrines is that of the infallibility and errancy of the Scriptures. That is the greatest doctrine. You say, well, in the Gospel, how are you going to know the Gospel without an infallible Bible? 
how are you going to know Jesus is the Son of God without an infallible Bible? Amen? All them other things, that you look at it, they diminish the deity of Christ. Most people just don't understand it to catch it. But it's there. They try to bring him down to their level. And subtlety through time, that's what the preaching is doing. Listen, if we don't stand on the Bible, you're not going to stand for anything. And by the way, if you don't stand for anything, you will fall for everything. You have to take that stand on the Bible. It is a must. There's no place in the Bible that it refers to itself as having error, being erroneous or fallible. On the contrary, the Bible says His word are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of the earth seven times. The Bible proclaims its own infallibility, its own inerrancy. There's no arrows in it whatsoever. Number two, we must remain faultless in our Christian walk before both the saved and the unsaved. We must remain first faultless concerning or standing for the Word of God, but we need to remain faultless in our Christian walk. It was once said, I'll give you a couple of statements, quotes I wrote down. A life lived is worth a thousand sermons preached. A life lived is worth a thousand sermons preached. This is another good one. Your talk talks, but your walk talks. Or, and your walk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Need me to say that again? Your talk talks and your walk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Amen? How you live your life says way more than whatever comes out of your mouth. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. He's saying, listen, the new thing that God did in me is coming out through my life. He put a new song in my heart. And because of that, people are going to see it. And, and listen, a changed life speaks volumes about God. He said, many people will see it in fear. Why is that? Because they'll realize, hey, maybe there's something to this. And notice what it says. And shall trust the Lord. Now listen. I believe we need to be a witness. Amen? I, I don't believe that the only thing out there you need is you're just living your life right. You need, because there's so much going on. But don't discount the fact that the way you live your life will be the difference between someone getting saved and someone not. 
Because if you live like the devil and talk about Jesus, you're going to discount everything you say. Matter of fact, you're going to make a mockery of Christ and drive them further away. Listen, I'd much rather if you're going to live like the devil, don't even tell people you're saved. Amen? That's the cold, honest fact. Why? Because you do more harm than good. We need to be faultless in our walk first before God. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 4 through 6, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. The Bible says, listen, we need to walk as he walked. Not as you please and as you like. Not as it, listen, not as it makes your family happy. Hey, listen, if we was about making our family happy, we wouldn't be here. Amen? We still hear about it 13, 16 years later. If that, if that was our goal, we would have never been here. We'd have never left West Virginia. But we're here because of God. Remember what Christ said to his parents? We must be about our father's business. I must be about my father's business. Amen? He said, I need to do what I'm supposed to do. And praise the Lord, you need to do what you are supposed to do. Be that witness and testimony. Live a life honoring and pleasing unto Him. We also need to be faultless in our walk before the unsaved. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Your life is read before all men. 1 Corinthians 3, 2. Like it or not, they're judging Christ off of you. When you're at work, they're judging Christ off of you. Listen, when you're out getting your mail, people are judging Christ off of you. When you're in the grocery store, people are judging Christ off of you. When you're out at the park playing, people are judging Christ off of you. Listen, Christian watchers watch everything you do. They're judging Christ off of you. Is it right? No, but that's the way it is. God even reaffirmed that that's the way it was. You're to be an epistle written, known and read of all men. It's going to happen. What if people was to write a story about the Lord Jesus Christ off of your life, what would they write? Would you even want to see it? Me? Probably not but we're supposed to be. Amen? Faultless also before the brethren. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameable we behaved ourselves 
among you that believed. Paul is saying, listen, I was the right kind of testimony before you. You can be a witness of that. That's what he's saying. Before the brethren. That's what we need to be. And listen, it's not just going to happen because you got saved. These things are things you have to work at. We must remain faultless in our witness to the loss. The Bible tells us in Matthew 28 and 18, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. You see, all the power that we need, because he goes on to say, Go ye therefore. All the power we need is available unto us to do what he's asked us to do. You can go out and, and go out not in your strength, but in his strength. He tells them in, in Acts 1.8 before his ascension, But ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Christ said, I have all power. I give you that power. Praise the Lord. In Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, Paul says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We have power in Christ. We have power that we receive in Christ. But we also have power to reach. Paul says, I, I want to preach to you in Rome. I have that power. And praise the Lord, he did. Now, it might not have been in the way we would like to see someone go, but he got the job done. Amen? Amen. Romans 10, 13 through 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Listen. I don't mean that you can go out and start your church and start preaching. But listen, you preach to people in your life. Have you ever noticed people getting convicted just being around you? That's the message you're preaching by your life. Bible says if you don't do it, they can't get saved. Now I know a lot of people will take and say, hey, they, they need a preacher to be, be saved. Praise God, I, I got saved under preaching. Sarah did not. Amen? Miss Stella, her testimony is she prayed at home. people get witness to. They're proclaiming. Preaching is simply proclaiming the Word of God. Listen, you can proclaim the Word of God out in your community. I, I'm not talking about getting you a soapbox and jumping up on it and going, ah, you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. I'm not talking about that. 
but I'm talking about handing someone a track and saying, do you know for sure if you died today where you would spend eternity? Here, read this. You can do that. You're getting the gospel to them. If no one gets it to them, they can't get saved. That's what it's talking about. Number three, we must remain faultless in our worship. In our worship. Too many churches in our day have substituted the flesh for the Spirit. Because many have failed to identify them biblically. You know, I, listen, I, I've been in services where the Spirit moves in and people get excited. I, I'm talking about when there's actually Bible preaching. Not get, getting in and, and trying to work up a frenzy. But where the Spirit moves in. And you get excited. Maybe you'll come out of your seat. Maybe it takes a stick of dynamite. I'm talking about when the Spirit gets a hold of you. You got to say amen. You got to lift, lift your hand in praise to God. But you know, I, I've seen a lot of things. They, they get worked up and they, they're not preaching any Bible. Matter of fact, they're going against the Bible and what they're doing. And they try to work everybody up in a frenzy. You see this a lot in the charismatic church where they start lifting up the Holy Spirit. Now listen, I am a, I'm just as thrilled as anyone else when the Spirit shows up. But I am not praising the Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says the Spirit is to point people to Christ, not Himself. When people start praising the Spirit and lifting the Spirit up, listen, that is the wrong Spirit. Now, if people are lifting up the name of Jesus and getting excited, I mean, I get excited. I get the goosebumps when we start singing about the blood, amen? amen. The blood of Jesus. I, I like that. That gets me fired up. Listen, that gets me ready to preach. But all this junk uh, 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 talking about the tongues and all that stuff that goes on in the world, this slain in the spirit stuff, that is not biblical. That is of the flesh. And, and listen, we must be faultless in our worship. You can't do those things and be blameless in your worship. Why? Because they're not of the Spirit of God. Claude has mentioned uh, one time back when he was caught up in that stuff that he got what they called slain in the spirit and it was laid out on the floor and couldn't move. He said, Pastor, I couldn't move. Well, like I've always said, listen, either that's of the flesh or an unholy spirit. And he said, Pastor, that was an unholy spirit. Because I couldn't do anything of myself. You say that could be in the church? Oh, Yes. Listen, I, I felt evil spirits in the services here. One night down there, something fell cold upon the, on the church during the service down at camp meeting. You could feel it. Listen, there is an evil presence in the world, and he's going to do everything he can to get you going down the wrong way. You have to be careful in our worship. It's very vital. John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such that to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is the key. Listen, a lot of people worship Him in a spirit, but not truth. Is it scriptural? Is it biblical? Yes. John says, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. Amen? When he wrote one of the books. We need to be in the Spirit when we worship the Lord. But that Spirit must be biblical in what it does. Listen, nowhere in the Bible do you find a basis for slain in the Spirit. Oh, and, and if, if you think that boy that fell out was the example of it, fell out of the window when Peter was talking so long? No. The boy fell asleep. Listen, what does that teach you? Don't sit on a wall if you're going to fall asleep because you might fall and kill yourself. Amen? Let's try it like this. Don't sleep or, or sit at the end of the pew if you're going to fall asleep. You might fall off and hurt your head. Amen? That's all that that teaches. And all this junk with the tongues and stuff that's going around. Listen, the Bible has got regulation for tongues. If it goes against that, listen, it is of Satan. If you say you cannot control it, if you say that something took control and made you do it, it is of Satan. Amen. Otherwise, if you're one of those ones that would get up and just start rattling off a bunch of syllables, that's of the flesh. Listen, if you have to take a book and read how to speak in tongues, and by the way, those books are out there, that's of the flesh. If it was the Spirit of God, you wouldn't need a book to tell you how to do it. Amen? But we must remain... The Bible says we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Listen, spirit without truth will cause you to blow up. And truth without spirit will cause you to dry up. And that happens a lot in churches. They have all the truth, but there's no spirit in the midst of it. And listen, you can have a dead, dry church. But the right mixture of spirit and truth will cause you to grow. And that's what we need. Amen? It doesn't... Listen, it's not going to help you if, if I give you nothing but truth. And there is no spirit involved in me or in you. So don't quench. I preached a message on quenching the spirit of God. Don't quench the spirit of God in your life. Listen, how do you quench the Spirit of God when, when, when something in you wants to say amen and you say, no, I can't do that. I'm too dignified. In the U.S., that's the way they act in the North. I'm too dignified to be able to do something like that. Praise the Lord. Where's the Spirit in that? Listen. It, it won't hurt you to get excited about the things of God every once in a while. Amen? He only give you a home in heaven. That's nothing to get excited over. He, he only has a mansion waiting on you. That's no big deal. Nothing to get excited over. Man, you're only going to live in eternity with Christ on streets of gold and gates of pearl. Nothing to get excited about, amen? Glory to God! 
But yet, that's the way we treat it. Listen, if anybody has the right to get excited, it is a born-again child of God. Amen. Amen. But we've let the charismatics scare us away from it. I mean, when people get used to get excited for God, they would shout. They would jump. Some would run. Now, if they're not preaching the Bible and they're just working up a frenzy and the ooh baby sisters gets up and starts doing the old wiggle hip things and people get up and get excited, listen, I'm going to tell you that's in the flesh. I forget, I think it's Larry Brown, man. He does an impersonation of that where he takes a Bible or a microphone and acts like he's singing and caressing it, you know, like those singers that... Uh, try to work things up and and it's just hilarious to watch but you know it, you might think it's hilarious but that's going on today that's going on tonight in churches right now somewhere in North America if not in many places they try to through their abilities to work up the spirit listen the song ought to get you going amen the words stir you up. Just like, that's the reason I like the song, It Is Finished. Or the song, The Last Blood. Man, that, praise God, it's the last blood. God says, it's the last blood I'll ever need. Oh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. It is finished. The battle is over. Amen. Truth. That ought to stir you up. First Chronicles 16 and verse 29 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship Him in the beauty of holiness. Notice, the beauty of holiness. It does not say in the beauty of worldliness. You know, I think that's a requirement in true worship. Worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. Psalm 69, or 96, excuse me. Psalm 96 and verse 9. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. There is that element of fear in worship. We need to know who we're standing before. Hey, when they praised God, they didn't treat Him like their buddy and pal. They fell down before Him. Humble yourselves before God. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sins and heal their land. That humbleness is because of a good, healthy fear of God. Amen. They're worshiping Him. Why? Because He is worthy. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our rejoicing. He's worthy of our song. When you sing a song, you ought to sing it unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Not unto men. Not to seeing how many different octaves you can hit up and down in your voice. You're singing to Him. You sing not to bring sight to you, but glory to Him. Sing unto the Lord, all ye earth. That's what we need to do. Everything in our life We need to try to be faultless. Are you going to be? No. But you need to be that witness and testimony. You need to be earnestly contending for the faith. So He can present you faultless. But the Bible still says, as I, as I hit this morning, 
Be ye holy, for I am holy. It's still in the book, amen? It's still in the New Testament. And if we're going to make a difference in this world, this is one of the areas we will have to deal with. You see, God is able to keep us from falling. He is also able to present us faultless. We, through the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the power of God, will have to have done what we could so He can do that. You can't sit back and say, well, listen, I'm just going to let God do it all. No. There's got to be effort on your part. I'm not talking about coming in and trying to work it up in yourself. A lot of people do that. Like Claude said, he was coming in and he was praying for the services tonight. I'm assuming he was praying, that, expecting God to show up and to do something. He said, I about had me a fit there on the side of the road. Brother Brandon said the other day, he said he was listening to, to a CD of somebody and they was just singing praises unto God and he said, I, I just got excited. I had to pull over and take a fit. Listen, we can rejoice in God always. By the fact, the Bible says we're two. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That means, listen, at home, you need to be able to rejoice in the Lord. In front of your friends. They need to know that you rejoice in the goodness of the Lord. In front of your family. You need to rejoice in the Lord. In front of your co-workers, you need to be able to rejoice in the Lord. At the store, you need to rejoice in the Lord. You know how you could have been a testimony last night? You know who I'm talking to. Chicken, 99 cents a pound. Glory to God! <laughs> Everybody looked at him and said, what's wrong with him? Praise the Lord. Everybody that walked in the store yesterday didn't see that. But God let you be there when he could. Or when you could. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord in that. Presenting us faultless before the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. And pray, dear Lord, that you would help us. Help us in this area to be able to do a, a, a work in our lives. Help us to make that decision, dear Lord, to uh, try to live a life more honoring and pleasing to you before this world. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to take that stand on you. And dear Lord, I, I pray that everything that is said and done would go to honor and glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Let's stand to our feet. I have